mind. What's wrong with the bike? Can we fix it here on the road or do I need to go take it back and work on it in the shop? But tell me why I can't keep cycling. You see, I wouldn't just stop and just walk it back to the truck and just leave, you see. So why doesn't anybody ask questions? And nobody will tell me, nobody. And I came to the conclusion as a Westerner that in, the, in, in America, if we see a, a nation up there teaching and they're in robes, we're not gonna question anything. Uh-uh, we're not. But we should be, we're in the, our, our basic, why are we not gonna ask questions? Because none of the Asian people are asking questions. So we better not ask any questions. We'll look really dumb if we start asking questions. Believe it or not, that happens, that happens. And then there is a kind of prejudice that exists and they might not want to you know, admit to it, but there's a, there is a prejudice to Western people like me or Bonte or any of the Western monks. When you go into communities where there are Asian coming to the talks, they will press us. How do you know that? What do you mean by that? And things like that, they would, they would never, never, never do that to an Asian monk, never. And I thought when I saw that in California and Los Angeles and the Cambodian temple, I thought I was shocked. I never considered it before, but that was something Bhante had to deal with when he was in Asia as well, being that Western monk. He got in a lot of places. He got to see to a lot of people. And one of the reasons was he was so tall, <laughs> big, tall person. And they liked to have the Westerners around. We, we shouldn't be treated differently, but we can't seem to make it stop. <laughs> you know, it's something that happens to us when we travel in Asia. Anyway, the importance of the Vasudhi Maga for us is how you practice the Brahma Viharas. The track of the barrier method comes from the Vasudhi Maga. When we explain joy to you, the similes we use, they come from the Vasudhi Maga. They were preserved there. When we talk to you about Sheila, if I, if I had one of the books with me, if I had one here, I would go to the Sheila section because I remember reading it and thinking how beautifully it was done. It was just really beautifully done. And um, how it talks about the Brahma Viharas also. And we, get, we got so much out of that that we don't turn away from that. The issue is when you tell a person how to handle the hindrances and it doesn't work and it stops progress in your practice, why is it so awful to question this if it's different in the text? And how we already had this discussion, I think it was here or maybe the other group, I get confused. We had a discussion about loving kindness and uh, not loving kindness. We had a discussion about the four steps of right effort and what in the world happened to them? Where are they? And you, you, if you back away from the four steps of right effort, if you wanna see what happens to your practice, turn them off, forget about the six Rs. And when a hindrance comes up, if you notice it's there, Go ahead, go over there and sit with it until it goes away and then see how you do with your practice. You should test it if you don't believe us, but by now most of you here have crossed the line where you have discovered the difference. There was a, the interesting part about the, always remember the interesting part about the four steps of right effort is that it is in tune precisely in alignment with neuroplasticity and the research being done in neuroplasticity, it just grabs you, you know. Here he is 2,500 years ago and he knew perfectly well that you could advance very fast, just like it describes in the Samyutta Nikaya, if you were using the steps of right effort in your practice correctly. If you were noticing when you had an unwholesome mind state, releasing it and relaxing your head and smiling and coming back and continuing, that meant you were purifying the unwholesome by letting it go and relaxing the mind 
And then by smiling and coming back, you were replacing it. And that was the purification. And then smiling and coming back is the replacement. So you are letting go of the unwholesome side and coming to the wholesome side. You do that 100,000 times with your brain and see what happens when you go out to work for the day. And you're going to start laughing when you start to get irritated at work because you're just going to start to let go, relax, smile, come back. Okay, fine. Are we done with this? Okay, fine. Let's go back to work. You're not going to let things bug you. When you get to understanding the difference with Atta and Anatta as the consequence of believing in a self versus the consequence of believing the idea there was no self and nothing is personal that what happens is you take things personally or you don't take things personally okay go to work and try taking everything everybody says for an entire day personally see how you feel at the end of the day i see i see a perel blink in her eyes yeah i mean try to do this and see what happens with the people around you you take everything it's it's can get so serious with people <laughs> There's a, a warehouse and this person told me, we come in the morning and this guy takes everything so personally. If you say good morning to him, he goes, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Why do you have to take it personally? And the other part is don't at this time in the world, please don't let anybody shift you around in your communication to think. Uh, that you have to take offense and be a victim in everything that happens. You're going to have a miserable time and a tough, tough time, you know. Don't let anybody do that to you. Nothing is really happening to you in life. This is one of the biggest underlying messages the Buddha is sending to us. Everything is happening from us. Mind is the forerunner of all states. So it means... Doesn't it mean that the listener has a responsibility, not just the speaker? You see, if you're taking everything personally and you go in to talk to a group of people at, at work and there's one person taking everything very personally, they're going to object to absolutely everything you're saying all the time. That's very difficult to deal with. But if you're not taking it personally and you're trying to see if, this is going to make our office, our company, our production line, our project, our brainstorming, everything impersonally. If you're taking it impersonally, then you're going to hear a lot of new ideas. And that's really exciting. All right, let's dive into these. First, we're going to go over here. Most everybody's here now. We're going to go over here to the whiteboard and see if it's still here. It's not, so we have to do it again. Okay. What we're talking about is we're going to look at the five faculties. And by looking at the five faculties, we're also seeing the five powers. And we can write off this one the same way as we can write off the four steps of right effort and the four steps of right striving, OK? Four steps of right effort are your six R's. And when you call it right striving, then all of a sudden it becomes automatic and it's happening automatic. So that's what this one is. We know that. The five faculties, okay, that's a neat five, isn't it? There you go. These little guys, faith, energy, mindfulness, and this is the one that is different than what is being taught in the sterilized kind of mindfulness that is the mindfulness. Not in the form that it's real serious. You have to get take it real personally, do it really hard. This is an observation skill. Mindfulness. Uh, listen, listen carefully to the two definitions. 
meditation is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how everything works. And if you want to extend it to the next length one, okay, in order to see the understand the four noble truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics and how everything actually works. That's what it means, okay? That's what it was that he was attempting to do. And there's tons of evidence of that in the text. Okay, mindfulness is that observation skill. So mindfulness is an observation skill that is very precise. And it also has a quality, this kind of observation has a quality where it reminds you, you or remember, you, makes you remember something. What do you remember? You remember the mind's attention, okay? You remember to keep observing and you remember when something comes up that tries to stop you from watching. That is when you use the six R's. And the content of hindrances doesn't have anything to do that's important to you. The only reason we say to you, uh, you know, um, the hindrances are your teachers. If one particular hindrance comes up again and again and again and again, you want to reflect on this and say, what is the core of this? Where is this coming from? In that way, it's showing you where your craving is most often, your personal craving, okay? But mindfulness helps us to remember, to keep watching, and see what comes up in our meditation as we go along and notice the hindrance. And when the hindrance comes up, it tells us, it, it reminds us, re, it uh, recollects that we should do the six R's. And the third piece is do all six steps. Don't try to do TWIM and come to me and say, it doesn't work when I ask you when the hindrance pulled you away and you felt it pulled you away. What did you do? And you say to me, well, I let it go and I came right back. Well, that's not the six steps, okay? Or you say to me, well, I released it, released it, released it. That's not it. Okay, I relaxed, I relaxed, I, that's not it. You see, it's like, I want the cake and there's six ingredients in the cake. Don't tell me I, I put the eggs in the bowl and then I didn't get a cake, <laughs> you know, or I put, I put the butter and the sugar in, but nothing happened. <laughs> you know, you have six ingredients for that cake mix. You have to put them in there and have them work in the six steps of this right effort. You can get away with one thing. I'll tell you something. You can get away with saying, okay, I've recognized I was pulled away. That's an action. I released it, it's an action. And then I relaxed my head, that's an action. I re-smiled, that's an action, right? As I was returning, that's an action, okay? And the re-smiling was bringing up the wholesome and then keeping it going and then returning, okay? Those are all five, our actions to repeat the cycle over and over again. I can see where you might want to let go of that one, <laughs> but it, it's a given. You're going to do this every time something comes to pulls you away. That's the one. But the mindfulness is what your observation power. So we want to be sure that we understand that we're not saying op mindfulness is the, um, is concentrating on an object. This is not it, observing. You're observing what happens when you are doing the, working with the object of meditation. And what is the object of meditation? This came up a lot last week, so I wanna throw this in here. The object of meditation, what is the purpose of an object of meditation in meditation? Have an object. 
Well, suppose you practice something with choiceless awareness and you have no object, you just watch mind do its thing. Well, a part of that's kind of object, the reason you had it was so you can come back to it. It was a home base. The object was a home base. It was the returning point. Say that the centering point so that you have a place to come back and keep going. So you're acting here and here you are and something happens out here and you go over there. Well, you come back to this officer, this object of meditation and the object we're giving you is the spiritual, the feeling of meditate, the feeling of mindfulness. I'm sorry, the feeling of loving kindness and sending the wish to your friend. So it's the feeling and the wish. That's, it's a combination of feeling and the wish. But that's, I wanna make something clear too. <laughs> uh, this is what happens to me when I start talking. <laughs> All right, it's the feeling and the wish is your object of meditation. So when you're pulled over here in order to come back, you come back to this and you'll stay here in this, in this bracket, you see? That's what you do. What I wanted to say was that the feeling, it's not important. This is what some people don't understand. They think we get the feeling going and we send a feeling to myself. Then I send a feeling to the person who is a spiritual friend. Then the feeling starts to diminish. Now, if the feeling diminishes and stops, we got a problem. Maybe we need to do some forgiveness before we do it. That's a block. However, it's natural, and we need to drum this into our minds, it is natural for this feeling that was like this big when you started, and it moves up to your head, okay, when it moves up to your head, and it becomes karuna, it's only going to be little, it's going to be little, and it's going to be softer, not hard, it's going to be softer. So this is how we know we're shifting from the loving kindness. We're starting in the beginning. And then this is the Karuna up here. That's how we know this is happening. So let's try to remember that because there are a lot of people are disturbed by that right now. And they're saying, I just can't keep the feeling going hard. Or if they do determinations and they want to say, I will sit no higher than the first jhana or no sit no higher than the, than the third jhana once they're into the jhanas, okay? And they're, they're asking to use that practice for a while, okay? If they're doing that, they don't need a strong feeling. They need a good intention, an intention to watch, an intention to observe. This is intention comes in intention to keep our mindfulness, our observation and awareness. Awareness falls in here, okay? So this was one, this is two, this is three, this is four is uh, mindfulness. This is the collectedness now. And this is another one where collectedness is a replacement word for concentration, but it's not eliminating concentration. I wanna make sure you understand that. This word collectedness is designating the concentration level and tone as productive, productive meditation. And this, by the way, is very funny. This one in the, I always remember this in the, you go to the meditation section in the Vasudhi Maga and the first three pages are talking about concentration. And the first page tells you what you're really trying to do is develop a productive level of concentration. It actually uses those words. I was really excited. I thought, oh, this is so good. Then I turned the page. <laughs> that was my mistake. And then it got into strong and this, and then it got into hindrances. Then we better destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suppress them, subdue them, stop them. You see, we, we should personally try to do that. And I'm there, wait, wait, what's going on? What's going on? Then I began to understand why 
it took so long for them to work the way they were working with that meditation because they couldn't get there if they were personally trying to be there and trying to make everything happen. There was too much description in this. When you get into it, what I kept finding was I kept finding there was too much personal stuff involved in this that I had to do. And it was like, no, no, this is like not going to be productive. And it wasn't, you see. And that's why uh, it stopped everything. It stopped it. And that's why they got upset in the forest. And that's why they came out and started Sutavada. But Sutavada basically were It sort of, if you listen to the accounts of it, you know, look at this book. I mean, if you ever look at it, it is the most incredible put together book I've ever seen. And I can understand some monks told me stories uh, of they accepted it because how can you deny it must be correct because of how organized it was and how it's easy to understand and so that it must be correct. Well, you know, <laughs> over the years now, if I had mine, mine conf or I looked at, uh, you know, Karl Marx's work and how organized it was written, I could say it's written so organized, that's what we need to do, that must be real. And that we would say, maybe that's a mistake. Well, maybe we need to re look at what this book actually was. And I still believe that the reason it was put in the basket was because so many people showed up from the place where Buddhaghosa originally was trained and where he, um, those were the people that came from, from, uh, from that university is still in existence. And I still think that had something to do with, that's just my opinion anyway. All right, let's go back and stay away from this. So the object, just remember the object, you don't grab a hold of it and try to use it for all different things. It's just there to help you come back, okay? The next one is, um, um, okay. Right, we need this right back into this. Wisdom. Now, if you're new to us, you need to understand our definition of wisdom. Um, the wisdom we're talking about is full and complete knowledge and understanding of the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of all phenomena that arise in your mind. That's the best way to put it. And it has to be that you're examining it and you're, um, you're learning about this in a very impersonal way. So you're more a scientist than anything else when you're trying to look at this and examine it and see you know, what this collectedness was. The concentration, we said collectedness because uh, last time I, I mentioned that different countries take concentration to mean different things and some think very, very hard concentration. And other countries are more reasonable to see that there are different levels of concentration in what you do. In music, for instance, there's different levels when you study voice. There's different levels of concentration and, and, and the enunciation and the sounding of the scales we do and all of that. So it's in everything you have these different levels. So we shouldn't think it's a hard, hard concentration because it won't work. Because as soon as we choose to make this, um, this object way, way, way important, then we're not going to see all the other things that come up. And the other thing about this is when, if we were to, uh, if we're looking at this, you know, this um, object of meditation, very finely, our, our sight from where we're sitting here, our, our visual line gets like this and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And we put a pressure on our brain. Remember I was talking about neuroplasticity and what goes on and everything inside your brain. If your, your vision is only like that, you won't see what happens from here, from here coming across in front of you or from up, from below, from above. You're only gonna see in your mind that one particular object of meditation. Where does it take you? It takes you to absorption. What is absorption? 
it is a trans state. What is the definition of a trans state? We cannot comprehend or learn anything from the trans state. Part of this is um, learning to understand what samatha and vipassana actually mean. Samatha, it, it, the samatha isn't the concentration. Samatha means serenity and insight means, um, I'm sorry, vipassana means insights, discovering new things, you see, okay? So you don't want your vision to actually be like, this is one thing Bhante figured out. You see, he want his vision to be like this so that he has a peripheral vision, just like you and I have a peripheral vision. You want to be able to use the spiritual friend that's out here as someone to come back to, to be there with you, but he doesn't want it to be anything that's small or that you would concentrate for. I listened to a lecture today about you can concentrate on blue or concentrate on a yellow circle or this. All of these things were used traditionally before the Buddha was doing it, the ca casino type stuff, anything to make your tunnel vision just like this so that it, it's so tiny and will take you into absorption as quickly as possible. But no one could get through. No one had the opening experience of the mind occurring. So this is about the balance of your concentration being important. The wisdom is keeping in mind how this experience works, the phenomena works as you are observing it. So if you haven't done, if you haven't done the dependent origination uh, training, you can go onto YouTube and you can go find the um, dependent origination workshop that I did back way back in 2005. It's still out there and it's been going up and down a number of times. It's had thousands and thousands of people that have watched that and really liked it because it puts it together for you step by step. But you need to learn that the most important part of the dependent origination to be aware of in your practice is how are things happening from the contact and then the feeling and then the craving and the clinging. This is where, this is where it's important, where the, the sense door has the contact, the feeling arises, and then there is suddenly a change and actually this stuff becomes really red. This stuff is really gets heated up. This is where the I comes in. I like it, I want it, or I don't like it, I don't want it. And the clinging is, why is that? Because blah, 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 story, story, runaway mind, mental proliferation. That's where this is, the clinging. That's where that happens, okay. All right, now we're gonna go back. Uh, if you, okay, I did, okay, I told you. Faith is basically what? Faith is simply you're putting your faith. If you believe in something, believe in faith that works, you never and trust that the coach is correctly what to do when you start writing. And listen to every single thing they tell you you follow the instruction, you have faith that the Buddha actually found something. He actually did find a way out of suffering in daily life, but then a final version in Parinibbana. That's what he did. And then he decides to teach this to others, but instead of teaching them by telling him about it, he decides to go through the suttas and use them to say exactly, try to tell them what happened to him and get them to see it the way he saw it. So he teaches them a method of direct knowledge, which is knowledge and vision, knowing something by seeing it. That's what he does. And when you master knowledge and uh, vision of how things actually work, you've, you've grasped direct knowledge very securely, and then you go into the very deep states from there. That's how this works. But it's putting your faith in something that he really did find something and he really had something important to show you and trying making commitment to follow what he says first by itself purely by his instructions 
then you say whether it works or not. But if you bring in other things to mix in with it and expect to get the same result, it doesn't work. That's what he's telling Vacha. Okay, and the energy level in you really has to do the energy for your mindfulness and the energy to continue your collectedness of, and the energy for uh, realizing your wisdom as watching it correctly and everything. That's what it's about, your energy, keeping your energy up. We can broad base the definition and say, stay healthy, get enough sleep, eat correctly, exercise, all of that. That's true. But I'm talking about within the, the session itself, this is what it's talking about, okay? So now I'm gonna go out of here and I had a really neat way to do that. If you want this, you can take it and save it. And then I'm gonna clear this. Okay, let me stop share. Okay, so diving in this, we have to try to examine what the Buddha left us in the Majjhima Nikaya in reference to the, um, the faculties. And the first one we go to is, um, let's see, the first one we go to, why is that? <laughs> let's see, okay. We go to 4321. If you have the books, you can follow. If you don't, you can listen and you'll get something out of it by listening, okay? I'm not gonna read all of these to you, uh, but some of them I am, just a few of them. So we go to 4321. And I really thought I would find more on this than I did, but it was interesting. Now, these five faculties as they're set up in here, you will run into the five faculties in two ways in the text. The first way you will run into them as the sense doors, the five sense doors, which is the external sense doors. The internal sense door is your mind sense door. So, if you look at this, when they're talking to us about this, it says, friend, these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain. They do not experience each other's field and domain. That is the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, the body faculty. And these five faculties, each having a separate field and a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain. What is their resort? What is What experiences their fields and domains? Friend, these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, and they do not experience each other's field and domain. That is that each one of these sense doors does not use the other sense doors domains. None of these five faculties, each having a separate field, a separate domain, not experiencing each other's fields and domains have mind as their resort and mind experiences their fields and domains. So it doesn't mix up the fields. They're just wanting you to be clear. In this one, they're just wanting you to be clear that you understand how your sense doors are operating just the way they clarify the consciousness in the, in the sense doors, that the sense door of the eye consciousness doesn't have anything to do with the ear or the ear with the nose or the nose with the tongue. It's just simple, it's, it's separate, okay? This is the beauty of the, of the brain. This is incredible stuff the brain does. Now go to 75. Um, 75 section eight, and in 75 section eight, he's pointing out to Magandia, the eye delights in forms, takes delight in forms, rejoices in forms. That has been tamed by the Tathagata, guarded, protected, and restrained, and he teaches the Dhamma for its restraint. Was it with reference to this, that you said the recluse Gotama is the destroyer of growth. Now he came to the Buddha and he was complaining 
that he was destroying um, emotion, passion, all these things and everything. And then, okay, now it says, it was in, with reference to this Master Gotama that I said the recluse Gotama is the destroyer of growth. And why is that? Because that is recorded in our scriptures. So in the other scriptures, basically the Brahman scriptures is saying that this was destroying the growth and uh, of, the, of this experience. The ear delights in sounds, the nose delights in odors, the tongue delights in flavors, the body delights in tangibles. The mind delights in mind objects and takes delight in mind objects, rejoices in mind objects, and that has been tamed by the Tathagata. And th these things have been tamed by the Tathagata, guarded, protected, and restrained. And he teaches the Dhamma for its restraint. Now, was it with reference to this that you said that the recluse Godam is a destroyer of growth? And he answers, it was in reference to this that I said that, that this was so, that the Godama was the uh, destroyer of growth. And then the Buddha starts talking. So actually this is eight and nine. You should go eight dash nine on this because what do you think he says? Here someone may have formally enjoyed himself with forms recognizable by the eye and that, that were wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and productive, product, provocative of lust. On a later occasion, having understood as they actually are the origin, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of forms, he's giving the example with the eye, he might abandon craving for the forms, remove the fever for the forms, abide without thirst with a mind inwardly at peace. And so this is what the Buddha is trying to explain. And he says, what when he works with the Buddha, he comes out uh, with peace of mind, okay? Now, there's another section we're going to run into here, and I wanted you to remember it, because what he's basically saying is talking about restraint, but what's happening today is happening back then, too. We take the word restraint, and it's like, let's lasso it, tie it down, and just... Um, stop it completely. And this is where we go to the extreme and we miss the lesson. We miss the lesson. So does it mean that you should not see, you should not hear, you should not smell, you should not taste, you should not touch anything? Of course not. It doesn't mean that. But it means that you should not crave and cling to it and get heavily involved in it, you see? and then start to lust for it more and more. And the mind gets preoccupied. You know, the whole training and the whole advancing in this thing, um, it's up to the person how they deal with this, but it's how you can tame down these things and bring them into balance for the lay person, okay? When you're going, I don't know how to explain this. I, I worked very hard as a figure skater when I was learning to figure skate and I did patch very often that spying a patch of ice and going and working on it for hours at a time. And this is like pedagogy in music. It's like you work on technique, 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 you see, and you get really, really perfect. But I worked as hard as I needed to work for the levels that I was on and I wasn't putting in the hours or that someone else would be putting in for um, USFSA trials and uh, those types of uh, competitions, you know, like that. I, I didn't put in the hours for that. I only put it in for the hours I needed for the level I was at. I see a tendency today of people wanting uh, the super mundane Nibbana immediately. And as long as you want it, by the way, you can't have it. 
simple. That's it. You want it, you can't have it. You have to let go in order to get near it. You have to get out of the way. You have to step back and allow it to develop on its own to reach the state where it, the experience can happen. So the problem is if you over try and you start to dive in and say, well, I'm not going to cut my grass. I'm not going to clip a flower and take it to my mother anymore. I'm not going to look at a woman ever again. I'm not going to look at a man ever again. You're not monks, okay? You're not. You're not monks and nuns. That's what we do. We, we step back as much, much more than the lay person does. But the lay person can get so much out of this if they take it slow and allow this whole thing to develop naturally. You see, if you push and push and one article said, meditate like your hair is on fire. That's the title of the article. It was in Tricycle Magazine. You can go look it up. But was that correct to say you have to do that? Like today's the last day of your life and you've got to get there and do it because I guarantee you're going to be frustrated really badly, you know, because it's not going to work when I want it now. It isn't, you know? So the next one of these, this one, okay, this one is basically showing you, um, how the Buddha is explaining to him, everything is about toning down step by step by step by step by step in your own pace. Now, the frustrating thing about this is that the next five listings in the index, if you're working with them with Bibi's, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, Majima Nikaya, is the next five references are in a list. That simply means that five faculties shows up in the list of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. So 103.3, 104.5, 118.13, and 149.10, and 151.15, or 16, I'm sorry, 0.16, all of those appear to show up in a list and only in a list. So it takes me back to explaining to you what the pieces were in the faith, energy, mindfulness. Um, if you have faith, then you're going to sit there and you're not going to get full and mindfulness will function with observation the correct way, just observing. What do you see? Just recounting, what do you see? If you are doing systematically your mindfulness correctly, then you're constant, if it's moving, if it's progressing, you know that you have the prop, uh, progressive or productive level of concentration in place. If things are coming up and you're able to see them clearly, okay, as you go on. And then if you, uh, have that operating correctly. The reason it's operating correctly for you to understand it, because remember when you're being trained, you're being trained in the meditation, but also in the comprehension and the comprehension of what is happening with this phenomena. How is it operating? The only way that you can get free of Atta and shift to Anatta perspective is to be able to see and understand the arising, the passing away, the, um, the danger of this and the escape, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape, those five pieces, you have to be able to, to watch it. And pretty soon what you see is, this is not yours, it's not mine, it's not myself. This is just happening in the process of mine. And you don't get so concerned because you realize that's how every sense door is operating. And then you can go out and spend a day with your sense doors one by one and prove it to yourself. You don't make your eyes see, you don't make your ear hear, you don't make your nose smell, you don't make the tongue taste. These things operate, okay? 
without you, the contact happens and the feeling arises, okay? So that's the end of that first list. Now, oh, I have one more, 152.2. So just jump up to 152.2 and it's the last sutta. I want to see what it says there. Okay, 152. And 152.2 doesn't mean anything. I can't forget. No, it's one. Um, oh, Jesus, if I guess. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Your faculties are clear. The color of your skin is pure and bright. What abiding do you often abide in now, Sariputta? Now, venerable sir, I, avoid, I am abiding in voidness. Let's just check the note here for a minute. Good, good, Sariputta. Indeed, you often abide in the abiding of a great man, and this is the abiding of a great man, namely to sit in voidness. So let's look at 1347 and 1348. 1347. Okay, he's referring to that. This is the abiding of such great men. Um, the Czech of Buddhas and the great disciples are good to talk with this. Okay, so basically saying that Sariputta was a Pacheca Buddha. That's cool. Okay. I that that's you've got me i'm not sure the value on that one on that reference i have to go back and look, do some work on that because sometimes the references are off but very rarely okay now there's another way to study the faculties and this is what you do you'll see when you go to the index you'll see when you're looking up the faculties it says also look up restraint of faculties so restraint of faculties look at this and you begin to get a clearer idea and this is fun now you go to um number two section 12. so you're going back to the beginning of the book and you go to number two okay and this is where you get the layout for, you begin to hear the layout for the way that the Buddha is training you to deal with these faculties. This is where you learn more actually about it. So in section 12, what taints monks should be abandoned by restraining? Here, reflecting wisely, you abide with the eye faculty restrained which taint wild taints vexation and fever might arise in one who abides with the eye faculty unrestrained there are no taints or vexation or fever in one who abides with the eye faculty restrained reflecting wisely he then does this with the ear the nose the tongue the body okay and with the mind. So he's working with all six sense doors and he realizes while the taints and vexation and fever might arise during the experience of contact, okay, in one who abides with the faculties unrestrained at all, there are no taints, vexation or fever in one who abides with the faculties restrained. But once again, you have to be careful of the word restrained. Okay, but restrained means comprehension of how everything is operating and how much knowledge do you have to support yourself. For instance, do you understand that what you see is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself, it is not who I am, it is just the operation of the eye in the body. Therefore, there would be no real reason to have such taints and vexation and fever start to arise. If you knew it was not yours, but was just process of the body occurring, you could dismiss it and let go of it much more easily 
So this is where you begin to figure out when you hear what he's telling them, you're beginning to hear um, when restraining the faculties, the comprehension and the balance in the practice of the wholesome and the unwholesome is what's important. When you go to note number 44, note number 44 was involved with this one. So you gotta find note number 44 in the back. And when you look at that one, okay, the primary factor responsible for exercising the restraint over the sense doors is mindfulness observation it's observation okay a fuller formula of sense restraint is given in many other suttas okay and it starts quoting suttas that we're going to look at right now so you go next one is 2715 2715 and let me get this okay I'm trying to get 2715 he does not grasp at its signs and features that would mean he does not crave and cling okay since if he left the eye faculty unguarded evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him he practices the way of its restraint he guards the eye faculty undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty how, what does he do to do that he educates himself on how everything is actually a process. If it's a process, it's something to be observed and not to get personally involved in. And that's what's really cool. Okay, the next one is um, note, okay, for this one, you had note number three, 322, jump to note number 322. Note number 322. Okay, this formula is analyzed. Now, this is talked about in the Vasudhi Maga, uh, but this one, briefly, the signs, the nimitta, are the most distinctive qualities of the object which, when grasped at, un, my, at, gra, grasped at unmindfully, can, can, can kindle defiled thoughts. This is pretty interesting. You know, because usually what you hear some practitioners talking about is I got to the level where the nimitta arises. The nimitta is the light that we see. And we get to see the light, but you know, we don't pay any attention to it because we're told not to pay any attention to signs in our observation because we're instructed not to throughout the text. And so this one is confirming that if you were to grasp at this, uh, sign the nimitta arising unmindfully you could kindle defiled thoughts and the features are details that may sub subsequently catch the attention when the first perceptual contact has not been followed up by restraint which this is telling me that when the nimitta arises the restraint is the six r's practicing right effort to let it go, relax, smile, and come back, which makes perfect sense. And states of covetousness and grief would signify alternative reactions of desire and aversion or attraction towards the subject. So it's saying into it, no clear what is your doing, what are you seeing? tasting touching what's happening and not do this blindly and just get involved in it in the wrong way okay 3320 is the next one 3320 and 3320 what's going to happen here is is really going to just um repeat this and you'll hear it i'll do it one time for you the rest of them i'm going to tell you where it repeats okay but a person does not grasp at signs and features. That's in the recipe now. Since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him, he practices the way of its restraint. And what is the way of its restraint? Is the six R's. He guards the mind and faculty 
and he undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. This is how uh, the monk dresses wounds. And this story, this is how he dresses wounds that come up. Wounds can be can mean things from the past that come up and you start thinking about them and feeling really bad and you need to dress your wounds. Yeah, you need to dress the wounds. So now what happens when we go to 39, 39.8, we come to, oops, 39.8. What more is to be done, monks? You should train thus. We will guard the doors of our sense faculties and on seeing a form with the eye we will not grasp at its signs and features that means get over involved beyond seeing it okay since if we left this eye faculty unguarded evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us we will practice the way of its restraint and guard the eye faculty we will undertake the restraint so the restraint has to come from knowledge of how things actually work. Okay, then you go to 51, 51, 16, 51, 16. And it's going to give you the same exact recipe on seeing an eye with the uh, form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features. So that's where the recipe gets set in, in uh, 3320. And in 39.8, it is a repeat lesson. 51.16, it's repeated again. 53.8, um, there is a training and a repeat. Let me see what 53.8 is. Same thing. Now, this one, in seven, if you go to 53.7 and start there, and how is the disciple possessed of virtue? Here, a noble disciple is virtuous. He dwells restrained with the restraint of the, you can say, of the, uh, this is Padimokha, so this one is being said to the monks but for the um he is dwells restrained by the restraint of the five faculties or the eight i'm sorry the five precepts or the eight precepts or ten precepts that you're keeping he is perfect in conduct and resort seeing fear in the slightest fault he trains to undertake the training precepts and this is how a noble disciple possess is possessed of virtue and how does one complete virtue how does one complete virtue? The noble disciple guards the doors of his sense faculties and on seeing the form with the eye, and then it runs the same way again. If he left the eye faculty totally unguarded. So the big thing here is once you understand how all this is working, and if you're really interested in getting to the place where you can experience the Nibbana, the opening happening, you have to understand this cannot happen by going to retreats and going home back into the world and not worrying about your precepts. I mean, your precepts leave scars of if you break your precepts, try to take them again immediately and get back on track, but you need to keep staying on those precepts and making them function in the world. And they do function very well in the world. But if you just play around with them, at retreats and come back and wonder why can't I make this happen? It cannot happen because you have to get, each person has to get to that place where the balance is there throughout all the pieces in this, these 37 things that are going on, have to come working together and fit. And they can't fit because one of them is this virtue thing. The precepts have the conditions that are set for the 37 to operate correctly. So it's like saying, how come I can't drive my car if I don't put gas in it? I don't think I want to put gas. I just want to drive it. I have fun driving it. But now I don't have gas, but why won't it go? 
there you go. That's why. So 53. Next one, 69, 69, 10. Okay. 69. This one is one that I wanted to read a little bit of it to you because it's really beautiful. And I mean, to get you to understand. Um, oh, Sarm is not here. He left. That's too bad. Okay. He had to go to another one. I know. The 69.10. Um, is talking about the forest dwelling monk a lot. And in section 10, one should guard the doors of the sense faculties. And if he does not guard the doors of the sense faculties, there will be those who would say to him, what is this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he does not guard the doors of his sense faculties. And since there would be those who kept saying this of him, the forest dwelling monk should guard the doors of his sense faculties. And this is true because when you're set up in the forest, when you're living in a cave or you're, sit, you're living you know, in an isolated area and you're going out for food to a village or to the people in your community, you cannot be falling off this way and that way all the time because if you do they won't feed you it's simple you know, they just won't feed you but they will keeping to the way 70 75.8. Okay. And this is sort of similar to the one that was in the front before in uh, solution. The solution actually comes at nine. It sends you to eight, but the solution is sitting in nine. But I'll read it from eight. Magandia, the eye delights in forms, takes delight in forms, rejoices in forms. That has been tamed by the Tathagata, guarded, protected, restrained, and he teaches the Dhamma for the restraint. Was it in reference to this? And this is the story about Gotama as the destroyer of growth again, appearing in another sutta. Okay. And he talks about the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind objects that have been tamed by the Tathagata, guarded, protected, and restrained. And he teaches the Dhamma for its restraint. He's teaching methods, methods for the restraints of the sense faculties that work for you in life, is what he's teaching you. Was it with reference to this that you said that he was a destroyer of the growth? And then he says it was. And now in section nine, but what do you think? Here someone may have formally enjoyed himself with forms cognizable that were wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire provocative of lust, but on a later occasion, having understood this, they actually are. Now here's where it tells you what it's really talking about. The origin, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. In the case of forms, or sounds, or odors, or tastes, or sensations. He might abandon craving for these things, remove fever for these things, and abide without thirst with a mind inwardly at peace. What would you say to him? And then he says, I wouldn't say anything to him. So he goes on and talks about this to him some more and tries to get him to understand. Finally, he comes around to understanding. And in the end of the Sutta, he comes around uh, to um, how much he appreciated how well he had been expressed and uh, to him, how all of this works. This is a very long Sutta, but if you have time sometime, you can, um, you can uh, read it. In number 24 in, sec in Sutta number 75, if you go over there, there's something interesting. 
so too, if I were to teach you the Dhamma, this is that this is that health, this is that nibbana. You might know health and see nibbana. Together with the arising of your vision, your desire and lust for the five aggregates affected by clinging might then be abandoned. And then perhaps you might think, indeed, I have long been tricked and cheated, defrauded by this mind. For when clinging, I have been clinging just to material form or clinging to just feeling or clinging to just perception. I have been clinging just to formations. I have been clinging just to consciousness. But with my clinging as condition, my habitual tendencies have come to be and this habitual tendencies is conditioned birth of reaction. This is the way I explain it to you because I'm talking to you from the seven pieces of the seven links, okay. Um, and um, the birth of reaction and with the birth of reaction, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be and such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So he's saying, as long as you are craving and clinging and habitual reactions are coming up for you to live through, you're not here in the present time. And therefore you start suffering by the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair from this, okay? And then there's just uh, two more that are in there, 107 section four, and I think this is uh, a repeat lesson again. 107.4. I don't think we need to do that one. Uh, this lesson in Ganika Mogalana is you, if you haven't read this, read number 107 because it's really good. And there are a couple notations in. Um, if you want to mark this in your book or take note of it, when you get to this section in 107 about the horse trainer, it's a good idea for you to go over to Majima Nikai number 65 at section 33. And that one tells you all of the steps a horse trainer puts a horse through when they're training him. But I found another one today that's really fun too. If you want to understand how the Buddha was teaching, there's another simile that is in, in Majima Nikaya number 125 at section 12. And that one is how uh, they train the bull elephant to go into battle. And that's really fun to read all the things they train them to do step by step. And I saw them training the elephants in Thailand years ago. And I thought that's remarkable. This whole thing is in here step by step. So if you read that one, um, 107 in section four tells us the same thing. If you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome states with, of covetousness and grief might invade you and practice the way of restraint and guard the eye faculty and undertake the guarding of the six sense doors. So that's a repeat lesson. And then in 125 at 16 was the last reference. And actually that's just a repeat of that lesson again, so we can let that one go. So the restraint of the faculties actually comes down to meaning a very clear piece set of knowledge in reference to the arising and the passing away of how everything is operating for faith, for energy, for mindfulness, for concentration, for wisdom. And as you're practicing through here, learning about the restraint of the external 
faculties, the external sense doors, which are the five. This is including mind. In a lot of cases, this is including mind. In some of the suttas, it only says the five. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. Restraining doesn't mean totally not enjoying life. And this is what the argument was in two of those suttas in pretty big detail. Yeah. The best part about Buddhism is that we are allowed to experience everything within the frame of the knowledge we have about it, as long as we understand what we can. We are, we are not waking up the craving and the clinging because we understand what it is, how it works, and then we know how to let go of it and replace it. And if we replace it often enough, what will happen? We will retrain the mind. And that's it, retraining the mind to let go, relax, smile, and come back. Letting the mind hear this message, never mind. Let it go, relax, smile, and come back. And don't dive into it and activate the fever and the complications of attachment and the complication of the past and the future, getting involved in the present time. And work with your present time. Don't struggle with present moments because present moments do come later on. But I hate to see a person struggle to use rollerblades to ride 72 miles to um, Mount Vernon and back again, you know, when they can only actually, they're only up to learning maybe a mile or two, <laughs> you know, this is crazy. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that if you didn't understand how to rollerblade for long distances so you never get tired, which used to be my pet thing but I ended up living in the forest where the roads had potholes and Missouri doesn't cater to uh, even long distance biking like Lance Armstrong type bikes you know putting them on the road because the roads are so rough and then there's also the aspect if you got your bike out there and you're riding along the road some guy comes along in a truck and pushes you in a ditch because aren't we supposed to do that? It's fun. <laughs> and it, no, it's not fun. You know, out in the country, there's no uh, guidelines. So the bike got hung up on the wall and the rollerblades got sucked away in a tornado at one point long ago. And the bike was sold to someone who was, all I wanted was for somebody to take this bike and actually race with it. So they did, a Russian guy bought it and he actually sent me a picture of riding the bike and that was enough for me. I was happy and very content, you know, to stay in the forest. So questions on any of this, do you get the idea of what these, what these are about? Hmm? Questions? I hope we have just a couple of minutes. You're all in balance now, yeah? You're all happy. <laughs> okay. I'm really going to work now. This is, we had to do we talk about the powers. All it means is that your awareness of these things that you think about and you, you might reflect while you're training. Oh, you, you have a question? Uh, I do have a question, uh, but please finish what you were saying. Okay, all it really means is that these things become automatic inside you and you're not, you're not having to stop and think about them anymore. When you get into the deeper states, you're saying fourth, John, uh, you're fourth and then start to work at fourth. And having, uh, 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 You is solid. He's okay. You are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't hear your last comment. I'm afraid you broke up and then froze. Okay. All, all it all it really means is that your concern for these five things happens automatically within your system. By the time you get to fourth jhana and you're 
working in fourth jhana, it's not something that you keep analyzing that much, you know, because it's happening automatically. It'd be the same as the right effort becoming right striving. And right striving is right effort is happening automatically. Yeah. So the, these, these um, packages, I mean, you started off with faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And we moved on to uh, the um, uh, sense faculties. Um, and most of your references seem to be around um, uh, the relationship with the sense faculties themselves. Right, right, that's right. So take, you take the lesson that was framed and then you look at the pieces and, and see where you are with what's going on with the lesson for that sense door and it all balances, yeah? So um, just to try, just because unfortunately I had to leave the meeting and then, and then rejoin. So I may have just missed a, a link in here. But what we're looking for is the, the faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom based through each of these sense faculties, yes? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. has yeah, that. This is, I will. I will say. I will say one thing to you here. When I talked to Bhatti uh, Dhamma Gavesi, like I said to you, these were a surprise the way they came out from the index. But there was no other way to examine this because nobody <laughs> writes books about these five pieces, you know, like this as a separate kind of book. And I went through everything I had and I looked in a different text and I'm there like, no, we're just gonna go through the references. And then they threw it over he throws it over, Bhikkhu Bodhi throws it over into the restraint of the faculties. You, you look up not just faculties and not just powers, but you also look up restraint of faculties. And the, mm -hmm. the trick word, this is one of these cases where the Buddha doesn't tell you everything to, to do precisely, all right? There are certain pieces that you discover when you're practicing. Well, where does it say that? You can't find that for absolutely everything. This is a good example of it, okay? Like you're running into, wait a second, what was this? This is a restraint of the faculties, but I'm supposed to take, so he's saying, take, these are the elements that are, uh, the components of restraining, restraining, uh, restraining your faculties. You have to have faith in him that restraining them is a good idea. But restraint doesn't mean restraint. This is the biggest problem right now in the world with a practice that moves path, succeeds in moving on path, and experiences as they're described in the text and the practice is as for and that's where everybody should be and if you try to start killing the uh the hindrance you're not going to get anywhere you see that's the trick okay. to this Okay, well, one moment. Could you yeah. just go, could you just go back a couple of sentences because you broke up. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's like musical yeah. chairs. We, we lost a lot of what you just said for the last paragraph, as it were. <laughs> Uh, Sister Kema, you have to again. Uh, you're on mute now. You're on mute. You're on mute. No, I'm not. Okay, now you're. No, on I'm. Mute. Okay, it is showing as mute, but I can. I'm not you. on mute. Can you just? Um, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you now. It's green. Uh, telling me I'm. Again, there is a problem with the okay. internet connection. We okay. need to uh, talk to Shashi you are about you. the internet connection. Oh, she got disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll call her. Oh, she came back. Hello. Hello, are you there? Yes. Monty, are you there? Okay, I see you. 
Yes, I don't know where Bharat is. Yeah, where you Bharat have to speak okay. to Shashi about uh, the internet connection. Actually, this was the geo connection and the uh, the one that we were cut okay. off on from the in the big pulled it. The one that we were cut off uh -huh. in the beginning was the house uh -huh. connection. So I don't know why we were cut off right now because this connection is fully green and that's good enough. Usually that's good enough. Okay. Um, the yeah. conscious seal was the first one and we were cut off in the beginning. I don't know why I couldn't make it work at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Hugh, are you there? I'm here. Uh -oh. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were frozen. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is that there are pieces that we come across that you have to, he left for us to discover that he's not going to have lessons that are very explicitly clear on them, but it becomes obvious because one way it operates in one way, it doesn't. You know, and this, this is, this is, for instance, when you're looking at self and no self, the translation and the big problem it causes, and then you go through the text and you find identification and non-identification or personality and non-personality. So then you have to play with it and figure out the root word and personal and impersonal for the personality or the identification for that matter. And then you check what happens if I take everything personally, what happens if I don't, if I take everything impersonally, what happens? Well, that's the answer. So the perspective, the right view, which a view of life. And the other thing is the Eightfold Path. Um, the Eightfold Path is something you have to figure, you have to learn about and figure out as you are learning meditation, that there is a community version for the Eightfold Path. And then there's a meditator's version for the Eightfold Path. And then there's a version that you can complete the Eightfold Path in one smile. But you have to learn mm -hmm. that and how it works by figuring out first what precisely were the folds meaning. And it, that's a problem area because people have forgotten what folds mean and fans. And these they have an elephant that if you've been in Asia, they have a, a big plant, very big leaf like this that has the folds in it that were the original fans. They used to take them and decorate them and then fan the monks with them. You see, these were folds in the fan. So you can't start saying, well, I'm only going to activate, uh, I use these in lay life and I activate them, but I'm only going to use these while I'm on retreat. That means I work with five, not three. Mm -hmm. No, we can't do that. Because the recipe states that to reach the condition necessary for reaching the path, all eight of the folds have to be functioning correctly in, in cooperation like this, the eight pieces, the fold, yeah. And so there's these different areas we run into where um, May is always asking me to do a talk about the um, the slippage, <laughs> you know, because there's so much, so many files in there over the years of stuff that has slipped away from here it is and it's obvious it works and now here we are today and it's not working and it can be having to do with concentration or the eightfold path or some aspect of the practice the way it's put together it could be anything but uh the the um the part, of the part of it is having to do with the dna of people wanting to be in groups and we're not satisfied as human beings if we don't belong in a group and once we're in a group whether it whether it works or not, we're not going to look anywhere else. And then people are adamant sometimes that we are a group and we're trying to get you to come to our group. We don't care where you stay. All we want is for you to get free of seeing this thing. It's, we're quite different about this. You know, if you want to help us to help people to see this, that's great. If you want to come sit with us, that's great. If you want to sit with other people, it's fine. We want you to be able to understand that this text was real, that it is, it is fully functional and applicable in modern life. And that's, I guess, where you would put us, yeah. 
Okay. Um, I have one uh, one comment from a very early um, uh, part of the of today before you got into the flow around the faculties. Um, is it appropriate to ask yeah. about that? Okay. You were talking about yeah, um, working about uh, when you're working through the jhanas and you set a determination uh, not to go any higher than a particular jhana, say uh, second yeah, or third jhana, and. And the fact you would you would then I caught um, a comment about the loving kindness would be only be a soft feeling in that situation, not a. Yes, not is, a I was going to call you, but I want to I want to tell you what happened. I never get to call you at the right time. It's not the right time for me, or what I think is the right time for you. And I've been for two or three days. I've wanted to call you since you wrote me that note. And here's yeah, the yeah. deal: I can yeah. show you exactly where it, it, the stuck spot is. The stuck mm -hmm. pot for first the stuck spot that's hard to say <laughs> is is on feeling in mm -hmm. tranquil wisdom insight meditation and the feeling is uh something that we start with in the beginning okay we start with two things we start with verbalizing the wish and we start with sending it to ourself bringing up a feeling and it all it always should start this way remember a time when you were happy it's a warm feeling in the center of your chest you bring it up and you start sending it and washing it all over yourself first you're filling yourself up with loving kindness then you take the other person and now we we you all know the problem with the word send or you know the misunderstanding of wish and all of that but now that you feel really good with this feeling and it's pretty strong with you and you send it to the other person it's pretty okay if it's running smoothly it's okay and it stays about that level but you shouldn't keep pushing hard to have a lot of feeling it's not like that it the driving force is ten is intention intention and staying with the friend to receive the feeling. And the big part here is what is going to happen if you are smiling and you are wishing for the other person to be happy too. That's all this is. It's not complicated. Your wish is just for them to feel as happy as you're feeling, okay? And then when it moves up to your head, people think, most people think it's supposed to stay strong when it goes to your head. And that's what happens that's wrong because you try to push and make it strong, but it wanted to move from the chest up into the head and it wanted to turn into Karuna. Now, Karuna and loving kindness are two different levels of feeling and texture. One is a texture that's more in the body and the heart and the one in the head is like just very, very soft and it's light and as long as you're moving forward you know that you're doing it right but if you start pushing with the make trying to make it bigger when it's in your head you don't need to so for some people it will remain strong but it, it doesn't need to be made to be strong because of that change from the heart to the head yeah i got two two questions then um the uh, for me, loving kindness has only been ever a relatively soft feeling, and it tends to be more of a smile rather than a, 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 a strong feeling in the uh, around the heart or whatever. Um, loving kindness. Yes, the loving, yeah, the loving kindness. Tell, don't tell certain people that <laughs> they're <laughs> going to get upset because there's really strong. Yes, you I see? understand that there's a but, spectrum but there's, of but there's a variation. And the point here is what is working for you? Yeah. What is working I... for you? And if, and if it's moving a lot, so a block is defined by the feeling just won't stay there. The block. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. so we have to define the block. The, the block is not just that it gets lighter, and a lot of people want to um they Bhante won't you put you quickly into forgiveness if you have it get much lighter because he knows that if it's moving to the head it's going to be lighter and softer in the head so he doesn't want to pull you away and start putting you on forgiveness but if it really stops here all together and you can't get anything to go up and you're 
feeling desperation or something about this, then maybe we're looking at a real block. So you need to define your the word block, what it really yeah. is or barrier. Yeah. And then, and then I, the second question is, if you make the determination to remain in the uh, no higher than the first second jhana, would you then expect only to have the feeling of loving kindness rather than... Oh, in, oh, oh, you just said it wrong. Did you know that you just said it wrong? Catch me again. Say what you said again. Go ahead. The expectation. The expectation. I will sit no higher than the first jhana. Yes. But you said, I want to remain in the first jhana. I will sit, I will sit in the jhana and remain in the first jhana. Don't ever do that. That's a direct order to your brain. Very subtle. It's wrong. Okay. Okay. I will sit. Your voice is cut off. No, my okay, voice is fine. And now it's fine. Can okay, you now, hear it? It's start, start. Again. Okay, it's green. All right. Look at your look at your determinant. Let's do it like I will sit no higher than the fourth jhana. If I said yeah. I will sit in the fourth jhana, won't work. If I will sit, if I say I will sit no higher than the first jhana and stay there, won't work. That's an order. Stay okay. there. Remain there. That's a no-no. You're supposed to permit whatever happens to happen. 99.5 percent. I'll put it that way. It's going to go no higher than something. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, but my, my suggestion to you, what I was going to call you about is I wanted to know if you had drilled yourself at all and trained with the clock first, how much you've worked with the clock. Did you work with the clock when you were at yeah. retreats to the extent where you got it working perfectly? Um, what I it was consistently reliable. All right, if it was, if you were waking up just the moment it was about to ring and you were changing the clock every day for about a week, I would like you to do that. And then I would like you the next week afterwards to start doing, I will sit no higher than the third jhana. Okay, okay. Um, but again, um, my question- Hello. Hello, okay, hello. You're back. You're back <laughs> okay. Are you there? Yes, okay. I'm here now. You just came back. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Um, so okay. my question is, when you make a determination to uh, sit no higher than, uh, say, second jhana, does that mean then, uh, if your intention has been strong enough, that you wouldn't expect to um, move from loving kindness to karuna? I can't say, I don't know. Okay. Because it doesn't have anything to do with that. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. See, you have to get used to sitting without expecting anything. And you yeah. also have to, you, one of the things is that you're very controlling. You want to manage, okay? As long, and any, any, any shade of management in this game doesn't work because what you're doing is opening up your brain to giving it permission to just be and develop at its own pace. And then mm -hmm. you want to take it back. Mm -hmm. See, when, with what you said, that was an example of it. I will sit no higher than the first and remain there only. Okay, that was your demand. But the brain was, Inter was your brain is trying to get used to being allowed to just sit yes. and yeah. you and, and somebody is going to be watching just to see what happens next there is no control that's why in the sense that when you're sitting in your your session itself the answer lies in the man coming to the buddha saying i want to get control of my life will you teach me meditation and 
and the Buddha looks at him at first and he doubts whether he should do this. But then he says, okay, I'll teach you, but you're not going to like what it is that I'm going to tell you to do, but you have to do what I am telling you to do. You have to follow my instructions precisely. And he says, okay. And he says, okay, because I'm going to ask you to give up all control in order to see how everything is working first. And you, and what he doesn't finish the sentence and say is if you'll do this, you will come out with a higher knowledge of how everything works than anybody around you. And no one can intimidate you. No one can scare you. No one can throw you off course because you know, I know something you don't know as the game. I know how this really works. And then there's no fear anymore. There's no upset anymore, most of the time, except when the dog pees about seven times in a row after, <laughs> after he goes to have lunch. <laughs> the puppy, <laughs> life with the puppy. But it just makes me laugh every time. He is, and he's playing this game. You all should know he's playing this game now. <laughs> you know, if I feed him and water him, and then he has to pee on the mat. You know, okay, I expect that. I go out there with the mop and he very, she very quietly watches me go out with the mop and clean the whole thing up and go back to the bathroom to clean up the mop. And in that span of time, I've gone back, he's done it again. <laughs> he's just, she's just playing games with me and we're almost to the point where we have the gate. And she'll tell you, this is the sad part, that little dog will tell you every time she has to go out She'll go <laughs> like that. If you can get up and get to the door in time, she'll she'll do it. But right now she's playing the game with me on the floor and it's not it's not pretty. She needs to have her own home and she needs to have a, 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 a yard outside where she can run around because she's really fun. She's really smart. She fetches and sits and lies down now and does everything she's told, but I have <laughs> I, I sent you a link to an adoption yeah. uh, thing. I don't know if that was helpful or not. <laughs> They're going to work on it in Pune, I think. They're going to work on it. And she's going to be mad because her mom's here. <laughs> her mom is out here. But, but that, you know, if she gets into a family, the kids next door adore her. But I don't think the mother really wants to keep the problem. Play okay. with her every day. Okay, so any more questions about the lesson? Any more? Yeah, and every time free, you know, every time it freezes, it's like I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> uh, maybe we end uh, today uh, early. Hello, Sister Kema. <laughs> we are back here one more time. I think we should say the say the. Um, I'm not muted. I, I'm not okay. There. I can. Uh, we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> it's very funny how it mutes and I'm, I, every time you guys freeze in your place, I think I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> I try, like I can see my everybody else is frozen. Okay, let's say the prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving and may all be kind relief. May all beings be share, share this, this merit, merit that we have thus acquired have for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.